I made it a point to say on the board and, and kind of what I just told the guys, like, dude, don't, don't shy away from it. Don't think that, you know, it's going to be some psychological mind F to this team, or they would have been better off being number two and may, Georgia being number one. Dude, I think UT parking hit it on the head said, I don't think Sark's Longhorns give an F about being number one. They like it for recruiting, but this year's team is solely focused on beating the crap out of ULM. Dude, when you get to the point where you're playing to a standard, that that's what it's all about. That's that's the Nick Saban Alabama thing. That's that's Nick Saban being pissed off at you know in the last fifty seconds of a sixty point win over Chattanooga that you know you got the wrong defense called or whatever. That's that's where Sark is coming from. And dude, like I said, if if being ranked number one in the country internally b- bothers this group or it's it changes your approach. Then, then everything we've talked about, the culture with the thing is moot. But I believe in the culture. I believe in the staff. I believe in his team. And Jordan, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped for for where this thing is at right now. Yeah. Hey, I can't remember the last time uh, Texas was the number one team in the country. So, um, 2008. I, t- I tell, I tell my wife yesterday. I was like, you realize the last time Texas made it to number one in an in an AP poll in season. I was like, we were barely married. We were about married for four months at that point. Just a little over four, a a little over three, about three and a half months. We've been married for 16 years. So it's been, it's been a while since Texas got to this point. But, you know, you look at where this program is and compare them to everybody else. I, I think one of the misnomers, uh, and I hope I hope Longhorn fans understand this is part of the deal with being in the SEC. There's gonna be a week, Jordan, where they're just gonna struggle. And I think Georgia proved it. Like, dude, win, winning games on the road in the SEC, I don't care where you're going, man. It's not easy. There, there aren't that many, uh, unless you're probably talking about, you know, going to play Vanderbilt in Nashville. Dude, you talk about going to Lexington, going to Starkville. It used to be going to the swamp, not so much anymore. But College Station, Fayetteville, like these are not easy places to go in and win. And I think Georgia proved that there's going to be games where Texas struggled, but for right now, right now in this moment, you can very much make the argument Texas is the best team in the country. They are the best team in the country. You think without question, even you've seen Georgia. See, I, I, uh, I might lean slightly toward Georgia just a little bit. Okay, if we're looking at last weekend, you can't look me in the eyes with a straight face and tell me Georgia's number one. I know that Kentucky game, the way they play each other, it's always going to be close. It's always going to be low scoring. It's always going to be majority field goals as to how points get on the board for both teams. But Georgia rolls out in Austin on October 19th like they did Saturday night. They're going to lose. And I – I don't have enough. I, I, I'm pretty sure Quinn Ewers will be back by Georgia. I feel pretty good about that. Um, but let's say he's not. I mean, the way Arch Manning played outside of that that first drive, first two drives he had, if he plays like he did the rest of the game, they're gonna beat Georgia on October 19th in Austin. Yeah. You know? So I think I think, I think Art- Texas has every right to be number one. I know Georgia didn't lose and they still hopped them. I know Ohio State didn't lose and Texas still hopped them last week. No one said anything about that. Texas should be the number one team in the country. They've deserved it, and, I mean, I, I expect them to hold on to that for, for a long time. So, yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm with I'm with Joel Klatt. I think there's a group of three that separated themselves from everybody else, it's Georgia, Agreed. Ohio State, and Texas. Kind of whatever order you want to put them in. You can make an argument for e- any one of the three. Uh, I'm pretty close, Jordan, for me. I'm pretty close to putting Alabama in there. Uh, you know, we'll 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 see what happens. Just because that's that's the respect one I have for for that program and that roster. And two, I I think all things equal, I think Kalen DeBoer is the best coach in the country. So I, I I'm real not close, opposed. Real close to putting Bama in there. Um, yeah. You know, all you can do, all you can do is play who's on your schedule. You know, you should never apologize for winning games. To the point the guys were making before they hopped off and we, we made the, the switch in programs. Um 
this is kind of what I've been asking Texas to do. If you want to take the next step as a program, you want to get into where you're competing for a national championship and you're in that discussion, beat the teams that you're supposed to beat the way you're supposed to beat them. Yeah. You're supposed to, you're supposed to beat Colorado state 52, nothing. You're supposed to beat UTSA 56, seven. And I think we can agree Jordan after watching the game, this is not Jeff trailer's best UTSA team. This no. might be, you know, uh, this is year five for him. This, this team might be fifth out of five just because it's a transition year for them. They're, they're going to struggle, but, all, if you're Sark, all you can do, that's why you, you play to a standard. If you play to that standard, it doesn't matter who the opponent is, where you play them, when you play them. Do it the way you're supposed to do it. And Texas left no doubt that game was never at any point in question on Saturday. And that's the way it should be. That's the way the ULM game should be on Saturday. And I'm not so sure, Jordan, if the Mississippi State game shouldn't be the same way here in you know less than two weeks. Yeah, no, they should. If Texas loses to Mississippi State, I mean, Jesus Christ. Um, considering they just paid Toledo 1.77 M's <laughs> to come pull their pants down and spank them till their ass is red in Starkville. Which, dude, that's... I'm feeling pretty, hey, I mean, hey, me personally, anytime the burn orange are facing Blake Shapin, I'm I'm taking the burn orange. But, I mean, with the way they're playing right now, are you shitting me? Are you – like, yeah. I wrote it in the round table. Like, Quentin Ewers, as long as he comes back before Oklahoma, I could care less. Like, let's be honest. I am not even trying to go viral or make a joke. If you put me at QB and handed the ball off every single play, knew I was handing the ball off every single play, versus ULM, Texas is still winning that game. Because even if we don't score – the defense is going to get a touchdown probably, right? I'd assume. So, yeah. I don't know, but the the Mississippi State, I mean, they look horrible. Like Van, I don't even know if they play Vanderbilt this year, but Vanderbilt might beat that team. Florida could possibly beat that team. I mean, it's not looking up for Jeff Levy at all. No. So. As a matter of fact, I was talking to somebody yesterday who who had an interesting take off one of my old college football takes from yesteryear. I used to say Jordan, there used to be a rule uh, it, it was really when when Guy Morris was the coach at Baylor. I'm like, dude, if you lose to Baylor, you should probably get fired. Like, it means your programs hit hit a bottom point. Um, yeah. and man, Gary Barnett, Dennis Francione, I Dan McCartney, I, I can go down the list of coaches that lost to Baylor and got fired not too long after that. Um, during that got those the kind of the Kevin Steele, Guy Morris days, but. But it was brought up. It was brought to my attention. It's like, hey, losing to Jeff Lebby in Mississippi State, it's like what it was losing to Baylor back in the day. Like, you should probably just not even make it to the press conference if you no. lose to Mississippi State. Like, I don't, I don't know that I'd go that far, but yeah. And dude, scheduling Toledo, I actually want to give Mississippi State props for scheduling Toledo because that's a no-win situation. Like, if you that program year in and year out, they're nine plus wins every year whether it was Matt Campbell or Jason Candle, that's a really good G5 program. And to play them, like that's a kind of a no-win situation. You know they're good, but if you play it closer, God forbid you lose, um, you know, you're not going to get credit for that. And if you win big, it's like, well, okay, you beat a G5 team. No, Toledo's really good. Yeah, okay, they're from the MAC. Like, who cares? It's kind of like scheduling Boise back in the day. That was a no-win situation. I always said scheduling BYU for a non-conference game is always a no-win situation because – they could just have a run of like 23 year old grown ass men everywhere and just be ready to physically dominate you if you got a young team. So uh, I give Mississippi State props for that. But I don't know that Jordan, that we can spend too much time talking about the UTSA again, because like I said, it, it was what it was. You knew Jeff Trailer was going to have to gamble uh, and go for it on fourth down, try to you know get some things going in their favor. Just nothing really seemed to work. And Texas pretty much shut down other than the one run. Uh, that they busted, it it kind of reminded you of the Wyoming game last year in terms of you know the Texas defense against a G five offense. You re you gave up one play on a bust, and other than that, that was pretty much it. Uh, you know, defensively, I I thought the best play I saw there there are a lot of really good plays, but that fourth and one stop, 
I know David Benda and dude, I, I need to ask the spotters in the booth that do the official stat to like maybe keeping better eye on that. Bear Sorrell got credit for a tackle, like a, just because he like jumped on the pile at the very end. Well, good on Baron Sorrell because you know that you know you should you you sometimes you'll get credit for that. But that was Benda and and Taff making that play. You know, Benda wrapped him up. Taff came finished it off. But dude, Jade Barron made that play. I mean, that was a hell of a job by him to set the edge in a short yardage run situation, force the run back inside. And on fourth and one, you drop him for a two yard loss and get the ball back for your offense. Um, so defensively, I thought they did what they needed to do. Offensively, I hated the injury for Quinn Jordan just because he was playing really well, other than the one interception, which that's kind of like on the video game where you know you mean to hit the pump fake button, but you push it a little too hard and it accidentally releases the ball and you throw a duck and it gets picked off. So that reminded me of, but man, I <laughs> somebody one of the part of the UTSA media court asked Jeff Trailer after the game if he was surprised that like, he asked him about Arch Manning if they prepared and the trailer was like, I mean, we watched the little film that was out there, so wasn't really a whole lot you can do. And I go, well, were, are you surprised by what he did? And trailer just has his head down. He just goes, no, You're like laughing, like, no, I'm not surprised what freaking Arch Manning did when he was in the game. I'm just glad that there's, you know, I think for the national media can do whatever they want with it. I think Texas fans know and us in the market know, you, you know who QB1 is. You're just, really fortunate. You're just really fortunate that QB2 is capable. And I think it, definitely for this week, most likely he's going to get some much needed reps. Uh, you know, I, I would love to see Arch start the game and it just, it just put Quinn on the shelf unless unless he's 100 percent healthy and there's no risk of further damage to that oblique injury, that abdominal injury. Start Arch, let him play and see what it does. Let let him get this week of preparing to be the starter. Just give him that experience. So look. This is why all the offseason talk of, oh, man, is there need to be a quarterback controversy? You need It didn't matter because what we what we said, Jordan, what have I always said? You're going to need both of them to get through the season anyway because Quinn yeah. has yet – Quinn Quinn Ewers is going to go through his career at Texas never going through a full season healthy. So yeah, you're going to need Arch at some point. I hate to say this, but did we not say all offseason Arch Manning is starting at least one game this year? And it's not because they're benching Quinn. It's because he's going to get yeah. hurt. That's just you how were, you firmly planted that flag in the ground. Yeah, early. And and I didn't disagree. And I, I don't mean to like, I don't like doing that. I told you so. I don't like to do that no. whenever a player gets hurt. But like, this was on the table the whole offseason, and Texas knew about it. They were well equipped and, you know, pretty nice when you have the best backup in college football, potential, potentially college football history. Like, I know, you know, Colt McCoy was a Vince Young backup or whatever, but during those times, was Colt really, like, at the level arches? Don't think so. I think so. I think uh, Tebow. At least in Tebow year two. Tebow 06 would, would count. With Cam Newton? No, that would have been Chris or, Leak. Chris Leak was the starter, and Tebow oh, was the yeah. short yardage guy. Yeah. But yeah, that, we're, talking about, we're talking about Tim Free. We're having to go back to Tim Freak and Tebow. Yeah. Right? <laughs> So, yeah, it's been a long time. I think I think I think your point I think your point stands for anybody that would want to debate it. But I liked what Texas got from Arch. Uh, you know, I thought the one thing that Sark said after the game that was most interesting about Arch's outing was the biggest the one sack that he took for that ten yard loss that yeah he wanted to Arch wanted to change the protection, but the play clock was running down and he didn't want to check and ended up you know eating it and taking a sack and. Uh, Sark was right, and Sark, Sark's forgotten more about quarterback play than I'll ever know. But that's one of those deals where it's like, yeah, that tells you the guy is thinking through the game. Like he's, it, it, it's not too big for him. It's not moving too fast for him. And I think our guy Mike Roach Jordan put it best on the Twitter machine Saturday. The the whole if his last name wasn't Manning crowd, they they were down bad Saturday night. Down tremendously. <laughs> <laughs> tremendously and how about how about trey owens getting in the game going two of 14 for like 19 yards yeah. three yard four. run trey owens was two of four i meant two of, i meant two of four about trey owens yeah i meant two of four he went like two of four for like 14 or 17 or 19 something like that yeah um and i know he had three yards rushing he pretty much just came in to hand the ball off um what i'm wondering are we gonna see colin page this season i know you know we're not we're told not to really expect it but like Man, if they keep kind of doing their C.J. Baxter impersonation where they limp off the field every play, like the current Texas running back committee, we might see Colin Page play versus ULM. 
Um, so yeah, I think you will. I think I mean, you will. I mean, I, 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 I honestly hope so because, like, and I'm not trying to be funny when I said they're impersonating CJ Baxter by limping off the field after runs. Um, but like, that really worries me when I see Wisner or Gibson come off the field like that, or even Niblet. Um, because I mean, you're already holding Jane Blue out just to be safe. So yeah. You know, but I'd it's love funny. to see uh, Page. Oh, he did get a carry. Maybe yeah, I just it, wasn't. I was going to say it, it's funny when, when you look at the box My score bad. and the, the two guys that had the longest runs from scrimmage: Arch Manning for sixty-seven and Colin Page for twenty-three in a game That's that Texas right. won by forty-nine Damn. points. Yeah. That was not I'm, that was not on my bingo card going into the year. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I promise. I promised I watched the entire game. Um, I haven't rewatched it yet, but I guess I just completely forgot that. Colin it was Page at the end. The ball. It was, Four it, it carries. The end. I remember yeah. seeing Belton Gardner carry, and I'm like, "Who is? It? Oh, it's Belton Gardner." Yeah, you know, but. hey, I'm similar to what I said about Quinn. Like, if there's a shred of doubt, hold him out. And I don't, I don't think Quinn's going to play this week anyway. Whether yeah. Sark names Arch the starter here in the next five minutes, we'll see. But you know, I, I'm going to say, hey, man, if Jaden Blue's banged up, like if he if he doesn't fully trust that ankle, dude, just put him on a shelf for ULM, and you know. Let let Colin Page and Velton Gardner and Jared Gibson spin. You know, if Trey, I don't know if Trey Weiser needs another week, but you, the schedule is working out really fortunate for you because you're taking some injuries early and you're getting to the end of the non conference schedule. You know, you got a favorable matchup for your SEC opener, then you hit the bye week. So, really, you've got three weeks. Not to say you want to take Mississippi State lightly, but you got three weeks. If some guys are, are banged up, you've got some time to get them right before you've got that just that brutal ass back to back with with OU in Georgia.